Hello and welcome back to the another episode of Daily Quiz for IAS Prelims 2025. It is 27th September and in this video we are going to discuss three types of questions for your prelims preparation. You know, if you are the first time visitor of this YouTube channel, then let me introduce this initiative to you guys. Every day in this video we discuss three types of questions. The first set of question is from the current affairs portion. We take up the most important articles from the newspapers. We break them down into the simplest language possible and derive prelims basic questions from those articles so that it will give you the idea how the questions could come from the current affairs so that it will help you get very well prepared for your prelims preparation. So this is the one set of question which we discuss in this video. The another set of question which we discuss in this video is from the static topic. You know, if uh, you had followed me, you would definitely know that every day we uh, we had started discussing some static topic here in this video and we had started with the Indian polity and today we are going to discuss few topics in the citizenship and uh, after discussing those topics, we are going to derive some prelims based questions on uh, on those topics so that it will give you the proper idea how to connect the how to connect your preparation with your prelims. And at the end of our discussion, when we will complete our discussion with respect to the current affairs and the static topic, we will, we will solve some prelims last year's prelims questions, we will solve some previous year questions so that it will give you the proper idea how the questions do actually come in the exam and what can be the methods by which you can solve those questions. So this is all about this initiative. You know, before we start solving these questions, I would like to request you guys, please uh, note down these questions somewhere or uh, at least take the screenshot of these questions. You don't know how much important these questions would be for you. You know when your exams would be near and you would want to revise your current affairs. And being an aspirant myself, I know how difficult it is to revise the current affairs of whole year. So if at that time you have these questions, you would just need to revise these questions so that it will it will help you in revising the current affairs and connect it will help you in connecting you with the current affairs as well and also it will boost your confidence before entering the exam hall so please do uh, note down these questions and also who knows there as we are taking these questions from the current affairs who knows many questions can coincide with these questions so we can hope for the best please do do note down these questions of somewhere with you so that it would it would help you in the better preparation for your prelims exam and also please do subscribe the channel and share it with your friends so that they may also get benefited from this initiative with this let us start with our first question it is about the comparison between the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme you know you would be astonished why we had taken directly questions here you know, before solving these questions, we will, I will try to give you some basic idea behind what was basic, uh, you know, context behind this question. If you had uh, watched, if you had, uh, you know, read your newspapers or you had watched any YouTube channel, any YouTube video about the current affairs, you would definitely know that there was an article about the Indian pension system. It was, you know, it was actually analyzing the three different pension schemes, schemes which were in the India from either before 2004 or till now, how we had changed our pension schemes earlier and how our approach has changed. You know, earlier our approach was very much socialistic. The approach of the government was very much socialistic. It, it very much defined the welfare of the people and we had the old pension scheme in which the government guaranteed pension for the uh, retire uh, for the retired officials there was a guaranteed pension it was not market driven but it was the social welfare driven so it was it depended upon the you uh, it depend it depended upon the social welfare it depended upon the will of the government it uh, it was very much guaranteed to the employee once he retired his uh, 50% uh, of the basic uh, pension would have been given to him as as his pension salary. So this was uh, about the old pension scheme. There was no contribution from the employee himself. Then in 2004, it was uh, changed to the new pension scheme in which uh, this new pension scheme, it was market oriented in which the, both the employee and the employer will contribute to this national pension scheme. And there was no guaranteed final pension to the employee. It would depend upon how market will treat it. 
they will invest that money in the market and it will depend upon that and as we know that markets are very much volatile they can change anytime and they can even they can they may lead to the high profits or they may end end all your savings so it was very much market oriented and you know usually officials did not like it and it 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 has seen huge opposition again and the government has seen huge opposition against the new pension scheme after that in this year the uh, modi government they had brought up the uh, you know unified pension scheme it is basically a hybrid pension scheme between the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme in it there is the criteria there is the criteria of the market driven also and also guaranteed pension also both the employee and the employer will contribute to it the contributions had been reduced from the employee side and it would be invested in the market and also there is a guaranteed pension from the government too so this is well you know well represented you know people like it more rather than the earlier pension schemes but still there are some uh, you know drawbacks some challenges with respect to the unified pension scheme what are those challenges first the first and foremost challenge to the unified pension scheme is it is limited it is limited to the central government employees only there is no informal sector and no state or public sector employees in it so it is very much limited limited to the central set, central government employees and also condition to be eligible for the unified pension scheme is that you are you know your tenure your service should be more than 25 at least 25 years so these are some uh, challenges with respect to the unified pension scheme here we had discussed in this uh, you know with respect to this question we had i think we got the basic idea why we are solving this question i hope i had provided all the required information which would which was in the newspaper which is very much essential for your preparation so with this let us try to solve this question here the first question says which of the following statements correctly describe uh, differentiate between the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme the first statement says the old pension scheme guarantees a fixed percentage of the loss drawn salary as a pension while the new pension scheme is based on market linked returns 100% correct that is what we discussed second statement under the ops the entire pension is funded by the government 100% correct whereas the nps requires employees contribution as well 100% correct statement 3 the ops provides a defined benefit plan whereas the nps is a defined contribution plan 100% correct nothing wrong with this statement so with respect to this question all the three statements are correct and from the code given below the correct code is option d with this i hope you had got the basic idea about the pension schemes in india and by discussing this question you had got the basic idea about the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme so with this let's move to the another question here it says it is about the rising conflict in south china sea and the east china sea you know this there was an article about the conflicts in the south china sea and the east china sea how china is claiming all the waters in the south china sea as their own as they have depended upon their uh, you know outdated historical evidences with respect to that and also they believe that they had drawn an imaginary nine dash line which they believe that uh, or you know under this nine dash line everything comes under their control so with respect to that they had shown very much aggressive nature in the south china sea you know why south china sea is that much important because it is a very critical water body it connects indian ocean with the pacific ocean you know approximately 55 to 60% of the global trade passes through south china sea and also for us india very much depends upon this route you know it is besides the trade route through the south china sea besides this connectivity between the south china sea and the pacific ocean there is also a huge you know there it is huge it is hugely rich in the minerals you know hydrocarbons it is blessed with the rich resources so because of all this every major country in the world wants to have control over it especially the neighboring countries in the south china sea or the uh, or the eastern sea east to china sea and in with this regard the china has shown it is you know it is superiority and is trying to curb every land in this so because of this uh, you know because of uh, this the importance of this uh, china south china sea and the east china sea there are rising conflicts in this region between china and various uh, various uh, you know south asian countries 
uh, Southeast Asian countries. So with respect to this, let's try to solve this question. Let's try to find out who, who are the conflict zones and in which and between in which country they are uh, right now and what is the conflict behind it. The first here, the question says, there are rising conflicts between China and other countries in South China Sea, 100% correct, and East China Sea. With respect to this match, the conflict zone with the country that China has conflict with. You know, China has conflict with conflict with many various countries in the South China Sea with respect to the various lands there. So here is a conflict zone and in the next column is the country. Let's try to find, find out whether they are correctly matched. You know, China has a conflict with Japan over Senkaku Diao Island, 100% correct. So statement one is 100% correct. Statement two, China has conflict over, uh, with Vietnam over Parasol Islands, 100% correct. Nothing wrong with this statement. Statement two is also correct. China has conflict with Indonesia over Natuna Islands, 100% correct. Nothing wrong with this statement. And China has conflict over Scarborough Shoal with Philippines, 100%. Correct. So all this, uh, all these conflict zones are currently matched with the matched with the countries uh, in which they are actually they they are actually located. For, they are under control of the countries uh, which control these areas and why China is claiming these areas. So this is nutshell about this topic. I hope you had got the basic idea, basic crux of the topic, and you had uh, got the basic islands there, which are the major conflict zones in this region. So with this, let's move to the another question on the next slide. Here the question says, which of the following statements regarding the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act are correct? You know, you would be surprised why we had taken directly question on U UAPA Act, but here is a context to it also. As the ex Tamil Nadu, you know, ex Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, ex Tamil Nadu minister Santhil Balaji has been granted bail by Supreme Court as he was uh, charged under PMLA Prevention of Money Laundering Act and Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. You know, why does it become so important? Because, you know, under if anybody is charged under such laws, for them to, ga to get a bail was very much difficult. But recently we are seeing that Supreme Court has changed its approach. Earlier, the you know burden of bail, you know right even right now the burden of bail if anybody is accused under these laws is on is on whom is on the accuser, not the uh, not the who accuse him is on the person uh, uh, the burden of bail is on the accused. So it gets it is very much it was it was very much difficult for them to get the bail. So with respect to this, the Supreme Court has made it very much clear that if we are not even if the authorities are not even starting the trials of these people, it is better to give them bail because we can't hold them so long in, 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 in jails, uh, right? As their even their guilt are not proven. So we are seeing the trends as money. Uh, many people who were involved in such act, in in such laws in such acts have been granted bail. For example, uh, recently Mr. Sodia got bail, Arvind Kejriwal got, got bail, even uh, Engineer Rashid got the interim bail. So similarly, Mr. Sa Mr. Mr. Santhil Balaji had got bail with respect to this unlawful activities prevention act. Uh, act. So in this, the Supreme Court further said with respect to the Section 45 of the PMLA that. Uh, in this, we should prefer to give the bail rather than holding them into the jail without without coming to the final decision. If, for example, if trials are still uh, going on, we had not reached to the final solution. It is uh, the court should prefer to give them the bail. So here, with respect to here, as Unlawful Activities Prevention Act was, uh, you know, involved as this man, Mr. Senthil Balaji, was charged under it, and in this also, the uh, burden of proof lies on the burden on the accused. So let us discuss this uh, uh, this question with respect to the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Here, let us see what does it say. Here, the question says, which of the following statements regarding the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act are correct? First statement, UAPA allows for the designation of individuals as terrorists by the government without trial.
still 100% correct, nothing wrong with the statement. Statement two, the act mandates a review of the designation of an organization as a terrorist organization every five years, 100% correct. Statement three, under UAPA, burden of proof lies in the individual accused, 100% correct. So with respect to this question, all the three statements are correct. And from the code given below, the correct code is option D. With this, let's move to the another question here. It is about the Central Bureau of Investigation. Why it is in news? Because this Karnataka government have withdrawn general consent for CBI. Uh, you know, they had withdrawn the general consent, consent for CBI. Why CBI is involved there? Because we saw that the Karnataka CM, he is involved in some uh, corruption case. With respect to him, he and his family is involved in corruption case. So with respect to this, the CBI was going to investigate in it. So about the consent there are two types of consent one is general consent and the specific consent this general consent you know if this is granted to the cbi then the cbi can take any case in the state uh, you know usually many states had withdrawn the general consent because they feel that it is the center which is misusing uh, cbi again against the states which are ruled by some other uh, opposition political party and the another consent is specific consent it is case based consent so this is about the general this is about the general consent and the specific consent here about cbi we should know it is the central bureau of investigation it was set up uh, during the second world war you know it uh, it gave it was uh, it gave get its legal powers by delhi special police establishment act uh, in 1960s it was transferred into cbi it uh, usually functions under home ministry and also it uh, it is juris uh, it, it, it is under the jurisdiction of ministry of personal public grievances and pensions too so let's try to solve this question with respect to the central bureau of investigation here the first statement says the cbi operates under the jurisdiction of the ministry of personal public grievances and pensions 100% correct statement to the director director of the cbi is appointed for a fixed term of 2 years 100% correct uh, and it can be increased in certain cases. Statement three, the CBA has the authority to investigate only central government offenses and cannot investigate state level crimes without consent, 100% correct. So for the state level crimes, they have to get the consent, either specific consent or general consent. So this is in nutshell about this topic, why we had taken it. I think I had uh, properly given you the context behind this uh, uh, this question and we had got some basic knowledge about the CBI here. So with this, let's move to the another question and try to solve that. Here it is the last question with respect to the current affairs, I guess. Here the question says, Operation Sukoon recently seen in news was used by India to evacuate its citizens from which war-ridden country? Is it Afghanistan? No. Is it Yemen? No. Is it Israel? No. Is it Lebanon? 100% correct. It was uh, used in 2006. Uh, it was, this operation was used uh, in 2006 to evacuate Indian citizens from Lebanon. In it, the Indian Navy was used. So with respect to this question, the correct statement is option D. Why we are discussing this question here? Because, uh, you know, Israel has started the war with Lebanon. Uh, which is, which may escalate by time and india is thinking of evacuating their citizens from uh, from the lebanon as right now uh, approximately 3000 indians are staying in lebanon so with respect to this we are we are we had brought up this question here so with this let's move to the another it is about sorry we have one more question with respect to the current affairs it is about which of the about the chambal river basin why we had taken this question here because there is an interstate water dispute between Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh because of the Chambal River Basin as Rajasthan has started the Eastern Rajasthan Canal project, you know, for the irrigation and drinking water and MP has raised issues about this project. So both the states are working on it and they are, they are working on the modified ERCP modified which is modified eastern rajasthan canal project so with the, by discussing this topic i think this chambal river basin becomes very much important for your films so let's try to solve this question the first statement it says the chambal river is a tributary of the yamuna, yamuna river 100 percent correct second statement the basin is primarily located in madhya pradesh rajasthan and uttar pradesh 100 percent correct statement three the chambal river is known for its scenic ravine, uh, ravine ecosystem and is home to several critically endangered species 100 percent correct so with respect to this question all the three statements are correct now with this 
let's move to the uh, let with this we had completed our sta our current affairs part now let's move to the static topic which is the acquisition and today's topic is acquisition of citizenship by descent let's try to discuss this you know we had discussed the citizenship as he is the political member of the country he enjoys all the rights he enjoys rights rights right to vote everything so with respect to this citizenship we we started discussing the acquisition of citizenship and in this we discussed about the acquisition of citizenship by birth now today we are going to discuss the acquisition of citizenship by descent so in this there it has also changed by time earlier what was the criteria that a person born outside india if a person is born outside india on or after january 26 1950 uh, but before december 10 1992 if a person who is of indian origin is born outside india between these dates between january 26 1950 to december 10 1992 so what would be his uh, uh, citizenship what is uh, what would be the criteria about his citizenship he if a person now if this person is born outside india between these dates he is a citizen according to uh, citizenship acts in india he is a citizen of india by descent if he if his her father was a citizen of india at the time of his her birth you know for example right now i am a citizen of india and i will decide to go outside my country suppose it is today it is the date between these two dates and i am working outside the country i am the citizen of india and i get married there uh, with the uh, with the local girl there and i got a child what would be the status of his citizenship according to this he would be the citizen of india because i am the citizen i am the citizen uh, ship holder of india i am the citizen of india so he would be the citizen of india so with respect to this it changed little bit after 1922 after 92 what how, what was the change it is said that a person born outside india on or after december 10 1992 is considered as a citizen uh, of india if either of his parents is a citizen of india at the time of his her birth so after 1992 you know earlier before 1992 it was way much patriarchal in nature it showed that it is the father uh, whose citizenship would be would determine the citizenship of the uh, child now after 1992 it was changed it is it did not only dependent upon the citizenship of a father even if the mother is a citizen of uh, Uh, of india and she gives birth between the dates between 1992 to 2004 if she gives birth to a child who a uh, child whose father is foreigner in the outside country he would be considered citizen of india if at his birth uh, his mother or his father is a citizen of india so in in simpler terms it uh, ended this uh, patriarchal nature of this law uh, of this act of this law in this Uh, in the next uh, which was changed in it then after uh, then it was further changed from december 3 2004 onwards a person born outside india shall not be a citizen of india by descent if now from december 3 2004 if a person born outside india would not be considered a indian citizen even if his par- even if his parents are indian until you know india shall not be a citizen of india by descent unless his her birth is registered at an indian consulate within one year of the date of birth within one year of the date of birth his birth certificate it should be you know uh, registered at an indian consulate and if it is if there is some unnecessary delay then the permission should be granted by the then the central government should grant the permission after the expiry of the said period and an application for registration of the birth of a minor child to an indian consulate shall be accompanied by an undertaking that the parents have to give the undertaking about it in writing from the parent parents have to give it in the writing that such minor person such minor child does not hold the citizenship does not hold the passport of any other country so this this is about the citizenship uh, with respect to the descent further Uh, we should know that a minor who is a citizen of india by virtue of descent and is also a citizen of any other country shall cease to be a citizen of india if he or she does not 
renounce the citizen or nationality of another country. You know, for example, if a minor is a citizen of India and a citizen of any other country, when, once he reaches the age 18 and he does not, uh, you know, renounce, you know, he does not end the citizenship of another country, he will be deemed that he is not the citizen of India. So this is about, this is all the criteria with respect to this uh, citizenship with the, by, uh, with the, with, this is all about acquisition of citizenship by descent. I hope you had understood this topic. This is little bit, you know, maybe uh, it got little bit complicated, but very much easy. Earlier, if your father should have been the citizen of India, and if you were, you were born outside India, then you are directly the citizen of India. Then it was changed. It was uh, uh, changed to be more gender neutral, and any of your parents should have been the citizen of India, then you would have been the citizen. Then finally, it was changed further. If you, you you get if you if uh, you know anybody is born outside India, then uh, the parents have to you know register his birth uh, with the Indian consulate within one year. And if he if the parents fail to do so, then they have to get the permission from from the central government. Uh, you know about uh, this. And also uh, the the parents have to give into the writing that our child does not have the passport of any other country and also with respect to this we should know one more thing that the child once he reaches the age of 18 for example if he is having the two citizenships of two different countries then he has to end the citizenship of the foreign country and if he does not do so his citizenship with respect to india will be cancelled so this is about the this is all in nutshell about the citizenship acquisition of citizenship by descent so with this let us try to solve the question on the next slide here the question says which of the following statements regarding the acquisition of citizenship by descent in india are correct the first statement a person born outside india is eligible for indian citizenship by descent if either parent is an indian citizen at the time of the person's birth 100 percent correct second statement the maximum age for a person to apply for the citizenship by descent is 21 years totally incorrect it is 18 Third, a person can acquire Indian citizenship by descent even if their parent, even if their birth was registered in a foreign country, 100% correct. They can also get the permission from the central government. So with respect to this question, the correct statements are statement one and statement three only. And from the code given below, the correct code is option C. So with this, we complete today's discussion with respect to the static topic two. Now let's move to the last part of today's discussion, which is uh, the previous year questions. Let's try to solve them. Here, the first question is very simple and straightforward. The first venture of Gandhi in all India politics was what was the first venture? It is definitely the Jampar movement. It was not well. After that, it was Rowlett, uh, Satyagraha, the non cooperation movement, and uh, Dandi March. So, with respect to this uh, uh, question, the correct statement is option C. Coming to the last question of the discussion, it says the Congress policy of prey. And uh, the Congress policy of prey and petition ultimately came to an end under the guidance of Bal Ganga Tilak. So the correct answer to this question is option B. With this, we complete today's discussion. I hope you would like the video. I hope you would share it with your friends so that they may also get benefited from this initiative. And also, I hope you would definitely subscribe the channel. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.